20th century was the most violent period in human history. The death toll from war exceeds 100 million and is still rising. But war does not end when peace treaties are signed. It lies beneath fallow fields, contaminating our forests, haunting our cities, poisoning our future. It is the curse of generations. Today, a new army labors to cleanse the world of the remnants of war. This is a place where grain fields and woodlands shroud a secret whose clues are a cratered landscape. Where road signs announce villages that no longer exist and forbid the simplest of pleasures. These are the forests of Verdun, where 10 months of combat in the year 1916 erased 700,000 lives. Now, brigades of men move again through the shadows. They are des meneurs, members of the French government's Département de Déménage, hunting for the unexploded shells from two world wars that still litter the countryside. Since this methodical work began in 1945, more than 20 million shells have been gathered up throughout France, a mere fraction of the job ahead. But peace has come with a price. The rusting weapons have killed over 600 des meneurs. Enfin, on ne parle pas du danger à la famille. On ne peut pas expliquer ça à quelqu'un de la famille. Parce que quand on donne trop d'explications, pour eux, ça y est, c'est la guerre, alors que c'est pas du tout ça. Donc on n'en parle pas. On en parle moins. It is slow, heavy labor the unearthing and disposal of the 85-year-old ordinance that litters the landscape, still volatile, explosive, and indifferent to whom they destroy. <laughs> Sown in the bloody soil, these shells have remained hidden since the age of the horse-drawn carriage, the deadly artifacts of French and German genius. In the First World War, military tactics and human bravery were useless against a new technological deluge of death. Twelve thousand miles of trenches teemed with hell-bound troops. Day after day, 
Year after year, millions of men flung themselves into near certain suicide. Falling, choking, drowning, dying in the barbed wire and the poison gas and the clutching mud. At Verdun, the Germans tried to bleed the French army dry and nearly succeeded. Millions of shells were fired here, most with murderous accuracy. But about one in eight failed to explode. These would sleep for nearly a century, waiting for the day manure. Sur la région où nous sommes, c'est-à-dire la région Lorraine, on fait une moyenne de 80 tonnes de munitions par an. Donc ça, c'est la moyenne sur les dernières années. Il y a des endroits où au mètre carré, il y a jusqu'à 2 tonnes de munitions qui sont tombées. Au mètre carré, 2 tonnes de munitions. Vous imaginez, c'est dingue. Guy Montpère est un former naval diver qui a retourné à sa région pour devenir un déminer. Inside the third house. Today, while his colleagues comb the cratered forests, he responds to calls from families who have come across the remnants of war in their own backyards. Each year, the French government receives more than 11,000 such calls. Je vais vous montrer. En démolissant cette maison, le propriétaire a trouvé ce. Vous voyez ce que c'est comme euh, engin de guerre Ouais. Ah oui, donc voilà, ça c'est une. Une. Euh, un lanceur spécialisé, c'est une grenade Taub allemande. Donc on voit là, il y a quelques éléments qui manquent. Il y a des ailettes ici avant. Hein. Ici la fusée qui est absente. Bon, en fin de compte, c'était tiré avec un, un genre de petit piquet qu'on mettait dans le sol. On retirait de la goupille. À l'arrière, ici, il y a un système qui, par la pression des gaz, a envoyé l'obus, enfin la, la grenade sur les tranchées adverses. Hein. Mmh. C'est tout. Hein. Deux ans maintenant, sur Arras, il y a deux personnes qui sont décédées. J'étais encore à l'école pendant cette période. J'étais en train de devenir des mineurs, si l'on veut. J'ai perdu un très bon copain qui s'appelle Luc Portebois. Et ça ne m'a pas rendu le métier plus difficile. Ça fait partie des risques, on le sait. On le sait que ça peut arriver. Je veux dire, même sans commettre d'erreur. Je veux dire, quand on transporte autant de munitions, quand on manipule autant de munitions, ça peut arriver. Et au déminage, malheureusement, ça arrive toujours trop souvent. C'est toujours de trop. Mais ça fait partie du métier. Ah, un obus allemand. German, 10 cm. The threat hangs over every house, every field, and every forest in the regions where the battles raged. Rusted on the outside, the shells are still shiny and new, and deadly on the inside. Farmers face dangers equal to those of the Daimoneur. Each year, their machinery accidentally detonates thousands of bombs and shells. In 1991 alone, 36 farmers were killed by these forgotten weapons. Since then, the government has stopped releasing casualty figures. Farmer Claude Broyard. Il y a quelques années, un obus a été pris dans une lance rotative. Il a claqué la lance rotative en miettes. Le tracteur plus de carreaux. Selon les saisons, surtout, on retrouve ça. On retrouve ça quand on cultive les champs, aussitôt la moisson. Alors là, on retrouve les éclats, des éclats d'obus, des obus vides, quelques obus pleins. Je vous dis une dizaine environ, chaque cultivateur à peu près. On le retrouve de moins en moins, mais on le retrouve tout le temps, régulièrement. Et vous voyez, on retrouve que beaucoup d'éclats, beaucoup, beaucoup.
the team store their deadly discoveries in an old fortress near Metz. The work of the Demoneur goes on in a realm where every footstep and every breath can bring disaster. just feel. If you do that, of this one you know. The most dangerous relics are aging chemical weapons. Many of the corroding shells are filled with phosgene, a deadly gas that, once inhaled, fills the lungs with fluid, drowning its victims. Until they are able to dispose of these shells, the Demineur stockpile them in secure vaults away from the public eye. Every Monday morning, weather permitting, the Demineur secretly transport their charges to a military base near the German border for detonation. While daily life continues throughout France, the men carefully arrange the rusting bombs and dig the last entrenchments of the war to end all wars. Ed, can you give me the lapel? It's a big one for a long man, or a small one for a little man. <laughs> I know that's that. It's a fat man. I say little man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Même si la guerre est finie, on travaille encore dans un contexte de guerre. L'armistice a sonné la fin des conflits. On a arrêté de tuer, on a arrêté de, de bombarder, mais les traces que la guerre a laissées, les munitions qui sont encore dans le sol, eux, ne, ne changent pas leur opinion, elles, ils ne changent pas leur, euh, leur raison d'être. Elles ont été faites pour tuer. Pour elles, la guerre ne s'arrête jamais. So far, the Demineur have managed to clear more than two million acres. At this pace, the government estimates that all of France will be fully cleared and safe in 700 years. Two thousand miles east of Verdun stands the largest war memorial in the world. Built on the bones of 50,000 soldiers killed in the biggest battle in history, it gazes towards the unmarked graves of a million more.
Много-много людей так и находится. Как они лежали здесь с 43 -го года. Valery Strykov is the keeper of the steps, a guardian of ghosts. He watches over the barren fields of southern Russia, where the armies of Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union clashed in the winter of 1942. Three million fought here, and two million died in what was called the Battle of Stalingrad. Strykov is a former oil field worker who returned to his hometown in the wake of communism's collapse. In the new Russia, he makes a macabre living, exhuming a giant treasury of rusted destruction and human tragedy. Когда я раньше находил, допустим, немецкого солдата, у него всегда было алюминиевое жетон, я как-то не придавал к этому значения, я там же его выкидывал. А потом думаю, а что это, это же то же самое, ну как сказать, душа человека, без вести пропавшей. Я их стал потихонечку заводить в свою картотеку, и вот за все это время где-то у меня накопилось около две с половиной где-то тысяч, если не больше. Of all the battles of the Second World War, none match the climactic importance and measureless carnage of Stalingrad. This was Adolf Hitler's last great thrust at the Russian heartland, where the fate of the world would be contested, like all battles in all wars, by ordinary men. Helmut Kronenbrook a mechanic in a Luftwaffe squadron, was one of them. The stimmung by the young people or by the soldiers, the fresh soldiers, they were good. Only the soldiers who had already done the First World War, and they had all the fears that the war would be the same as the First World War, the First World War, the First World War, the First World War, Und äh, deswegen haben die Befürchtungen gehabt, dass das wieder so wird wie 1918 oder so. Ja. Die jungen Leute, die davon nichts mitgekriegt hatten vorher, die waren dann für sich äh, optimistischer, weil der Polen feldzufeldmäßig schnell gegangen hat. Ja. Und erst recht optimistisch sind sie geworden, als äh, der Frankreich-Feldzug so schnell zu Ende war. Ja. Sixty years ago, Nazi power seemed unstoppable. Hitler's divisions had conquered most of Europe, enslaving a dozen nations. Now it was to be Russia's turn. By October of 1942, the Russians and Germans were fighting a ferocious battle in the rubble of the city. Against all odds, the Red Army began to force the invaders back, and they waited for winter. For the Soviet Union, the defense of Stalingrad became the symbol of national salvation. For Helmut Kronenbrock, it remains the defining event of his life by the memories of the friends who still lie on foreign soil. Jetzt fünf Sekunden warten. Jetzt. Ich habe schon die ganzen Jahre alles, was ich kriegen konnte, über Stalingrad gelesen, auch die anderen Regimentsgeschichten gelesen. Ich wollte, ich wollte eigentlich sehen, wo na wo unsere Kameraden geblieben sind.
Nearly 60 years after he fought at Stalingrad, Helmut Cronenbrook returns to the catacombs to search for the spirits of his friends. Valery Strykov has received many requests for help from German veterans, and he has accepted the grisly work, for profit at first, but now with a growing sense of friendship. Es hat mich mehr interessiert, wo die geblieben sind, wo, sie ausge, wo die Kameraden ausgegraben wurden. Ja, wir haben ja die, die Bilder nun gesehen, wo die einzelnen Grabungen gemacht worden sind. Ja? Und das wollte ich sehen, ob da irgendwas noch übrig war oder erkennen, zu erkennen war. Strykov believes that perhaps even Stalingrad is a wound that time may heal. And he understands that the soldiers who wore these name tags were equal in their bravery and their sacrifice. <laughs> By the beginning of 1943, the Nazi divisions were dug in, outgunned, surrounded, and starving. Only a few Luftwaffe planes were able to penetrate the Russian guns and deliver their countrymen to safety. Among those lucky to escape was Helmut Cronenbrook. As the tide turned, the Red Army sought revenge for the millions of Russians killed during the Nazi invasion. In the bitter cold of winter, they offered no mercy no quarter to the encircled Germans. Early in February, as the generals parlayed and the invaders offered their surrender, 800,000 Germans and more than a million Russians were left where they fell or were heaped in mountains of human flesh. Я не знаю, как этим полям можно было бы вообще подойти. Здесь такая была вонища от трупов. Не убранные. Почему? Сейчас скажу. Во-первых, людей не хватало на уборку трупов раз. В городе другое дело. А здесь еще были минные поля. Их сначала надо было разминировать, а потом уже убирать трупы. Так что воронье здесь кружилось полный рост. On the prairie where Hitler's dreams of conquest perished, the Russian government has allowed Germany to honor her dead for the first time since the war.
At this new cemetery and memorial, the names of 15,000 German men, unearthed and identified, have been inscribed. For an old soldier, it is a place to touch the past and mourn the comrades who were lost to him, to their families, and to history. So alt wie ich, ja, wäre der Mann jetzt. Ja, das ist noch jünger, ja, 23. Habe ich keinen meiner Kameraden gefunden, die in Stalingrad geblieben sind. Den das Los dieser Gefangenen sich vor Augen hält, kann man Gott danken, dass man da noch das Glück gehabt hat, da rauszukommen. Я думаю, более 150 тысяч точно. Более 150 тысяч. Мой внук еще бы, может, будет работать на ней. Мне на мою жизнь хватит. In the United States, the war in Vietnam lasted less than 10 years. A decade of escalation, desperation, and eventual defeat. The Americans dropped more bombs here than were used by all sides combined during the entire Second World War. When they could not bomb their enemy into submission, they employed a much more insidious weapon, a poisonous chemical rain sprayed by aircraft to melt away the dense rainforest hiding places of an invisible foe. Còn thời gian mà tôi ở Lào thì giúp hạ bên Hà Lào. Thì khi mà treo vọng nằm ở dưới Thì nghe máy bay trên thì biết là máy bay thôi Nhưng mà mình kín rồi thế cũng biết đâu Nhưng khi máy bay rải trước độc chủng Như mưa vùng đó thì buổi sáng Thì buổi chiều thấy cả cái đường và Cả cái, cái rừng nữa là có như hẻo khô lại hết Khi nữa mới gọi là biết là, là chất độc chứ Lúc đó là cũng không biết chất độc Nói máy bay bay qua là mưa Mưa phùng thôi, nhưng mà sau khi mà bay bay trong ngày hôm nữa thì buổi chiều là coi như là cây lạ coi như khô rồng hết. Khi nữa mới biết cả à, chất độc. Con đi thì không, nhưng mà con đi ấy, nói ra thì thiệt tình mà nói tôi rất buồn. Khi ông bởi chấp chờ việc nói ma răng ri. Khi ông dơ cái tay ri ông hỏi cho tôi thì tôi rất buồn cho con với lắm. Trường khi con nhỏ ông bởi chấp chờ mới được nói mà dơ bằng tay ri ngồi bà ba răng ri. Tôi buồn là buồn cho con thôi.
The aftermath of the Vietnam War seems to funnel from a single cause. Throughout the 1960s, American aircraft fanned out across southern Vietnam, showering the forests with over 70 million liters of herbicides, the most common of which was codenamed Agent Orange, a toxic drizzle that destroyed plant life within a matter of hours. Thirty years later, the effectiveness of the defoliant is still visible in a patchwork of living forests bordered by dead zones. The boundaries are sharp and clear. Where Agent Orange was sprayed, only a thin ground cover has regrown, and the soil retains the residue of a compound called dioxin, one of the most dangerous chemicals ever concocted. Dr. Lee Cao Dai heads the Agent Orange Victims Fund of the Vietnamese Red Cross. Agent Orange, sure, kill people. And kill a long time, a long time. Has a very lasting effect. Not the actual effect, effect when they are sprayed, but the effect last very long time, many, many decades, many, many generations so far from each other and the aftermath. Along the narrow spine of central Vietnam is a valley called Aloy, once a vital link in the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the secret supply route for fighters, weapons, and supplies from the communist north. It was a primary target of the Agent Orange campaign. Today, a group of Canadian scientists are studying the long-term effects of dioxin poisoning. In Vietnam, the uh, dioxin clearly resulted in places from the Agent Orange applications. The families uh, have been resident in the valley for um, several generations. They don't, there's not, not a lot of movement in and out of the valley. Families still live off the land. They raise fish, they raise ducks. They're pretty well living on things that they can grow and and produce. Dioxin spreads through the food chain from waterfowl and fish into the human diet. It is in the water and the soil itself. They live in very poor, small huts uh, and uh, they have dirt floors and uh, Children are playing in the dirt and they're ingesting the dust and, and they're plowing in the fields uh, in, the, in the mud for the rice paddies. People here are confined by twin afflictions, poverty and poison. Those who endured the spraying are still shaken by the memory. <laughs> We took uh, blood samples from people who were born since the war. These are uh, um, kids down to 12 years old that uh, have uh, quite high levels of dioxin in their system, so they could only get it from their existing environment. Dr. Lee Cao 
đó là vì bệnh độc ngành cho cam Thirty years after the war, the children of Vietnam may be the lingering victims of an environmental horror. To cope with the problem, the Vietnamese have set up special care facilities in places like the central city of Hue, which they call peace villages. But there is no truce, no treaty, that can make these children whole again. Nếu như những cái trường hợp mà bị nhiễm chất độc da cam thì càng tốt. Thì như vậy đó là một cái tiêu chí. Ở đây là những cái trường hợp mà nghi nhiễm chất độc da cam á thì chúng tôi dựa vào hai cái tiêu chí chính. Cái tiêu chí thứ nhất đó là những cái đứa trẻ con của những người bố, người mẹ hoặc là À, cựu chiến binh hoặc là sống ở những cái vùng mà bị rải chất độc thứ hai là đứa trẻ nó có cả cái khuyết tật mà không phải gây nên do những cái bệnh lý thông thường như chúng tôi thường gặp bây giờ những cái trường hợp mà không có điều kiện đưa con vào đây á thì như tôi nói cái này là cái trung tâm này có cái nhiệm vụ thứ hai là triển khai cái chương trình phục hồi chức năng dựa vào cộng đồng. Tất nhiên là cả bộ ở đây sẽ tổ chức cả cái đợt huấn luyện cho cái cán bộ y tế ở tại cơ sở. Cái cách và đồng thời huấn luyện cho gia đình ở tại cộng đồng cái cách chăm sóc phục hồi chức năng cho trẻ. The Vietnamese believe that more than half a million children have been affected by chemical residues left over from the war. All across this country, there is anger at the American government about this issue. Thousands of U.S. veterans now receive compensation for illnesses linked to dioxin. But so far, Washington has refused to compensate the Vietnamese, claiming more research is needed. Yet American lab studies have already linked dioxin to cancer, blood disease, and birth defects. In old Saigon, now Ho Chi Minh City, at a hospital called Tu Du, there are victims that the public never sees. Dozens of severely disabled children who have been abandoned by their parents. Scientists have concluded that this country has the largest contamination of dioxin in the world. Since the end of the war, the Vietnamese have compiled evidence of its deadly effects. But to test each surviving child for dioxin residue costs a thousand dollars, a price far beyond the means of a nation still recovering from the war. It's a problem of uh, 
of uh, not only of humanitarian, but also a problem of human right. She never knows so well. She never knows so well, so children. She never heard about so well. They are born after so well, many, many, many long time, even, even decades after so well. And even so, they are affected by, by so well. So it's a problem of human rights, I, I believe. Few places are as familiar with war as this. It is a city that witnessed the opening gunshots of the First World War and was occupied in the second. Then in the 1990s, it exploded again in blood and horror as all the lessons of the 20th century were mocked by men with guns. In Sarajevo, 10,000 people died in the longest siege in modern history. Now the siege has ended, and Sarajevo slowly revives and rebuilds. 350,000 people live in a city whose hatreds may have been subdued, but whose remnants still linger. In psychological cen center where I'm working, every day we have more and more people and we are surprised that we have uh, every day more men, because in Bosnian society, uh, men uh, don't used to say, I need psychological help. They used to be macho, or, but now they realize if you have nightmares during five or more years, if you, you are very aggressive, you are very depressive, or it's, uh, it's really time to say, I need help. We have now also uh, some kind of, uh, of uh, people who are working in uh, the miners' team. And they are full of trauma, full of trauma, because uh, they, they didn't finish any trauma of war and they started continue uh, working in very dangerous job, what is very, very bad for them. I think they will have prolonged psycho, psycho troubles in the future.
Since 1992, landmines have killed over 4,000 people in Bosnia, three quarters of them civilians. And the UN estimates there are still over a million mines buried throughout the country. A much bigger problem is UXOs, unexploded ordnance. Collecting and disarming them is a slow and tedious ordeal, undertaken by men like Predrag Gavric of the Bosnian government's civil protection team. Radimo sa kantonalnim štabovima civilne zaštite, uništavamo žetvu, uništavamo neeksplodirane sredstva. Kupimo neeksplodirane sredstva nekad na licu mjesta ako je opasno, nekad radimo skupljama ako mislimo da je bezbjedno, pa nakon određenog skupljanja, određene količine, onda vršimo uništavanje toga. Ne prikupljene neeksplodirane ubojne sredstava. This factory manufactured mortars and shells that were used by Bosnian Serbs against Sarajevo. Gavric himself worked here before the war. But when the siege of the city began, he chose to fight with the government forces against his fellow Serbs. I was in the military and we worked for a long time. This factory worked well and worked well. I meni je to smiješno bilo u ratu na kraju krava kad sam imao municiju po svojoj glavi dobio. To je možda neka kazna, ne mogu reći ona je da li je Božija ali kakva je kazna. Mi smo davali drugima da, da, da se tuku između sebe s tom našom municijom. I na kraju sam mi tu municiju dobili po leđima. Tako da nije to, to je možda, možda neki, neki to pravde, neka ravnoteža da uvijek, uvijek... da moraš malo razmišljati o tome i kad radiš i šta radiš i kako radiš i kako živiš u životu na kraju krajeva. The siege of Sarajevo tore families apart in seconds and left wounds that will ache for years. I had a bad thing in the war that was brought to me a private thing. My wife was born in 1993. I was born with two children who were young. What's going on? After his wife was killed by a sniper in the first months of the siege, Gavric could have gathered his children and joined the millions of Bosnian refugees. But he chose to remain, to defend his city and protect his teenage son and daughter through 1,300 days of fear. The siege has ended, but his children are still terrified. Well, I think it's very dangerous. I mean, I know lots of my friends, their parents, they don't, they don't do it. They, they don't risk their lives. But you know that it has, someone has to do it, right? Yes. Yeah. Maybe someone who, who mm, doesn't have family or something, who is alone, who lives alone. Well, I think... Uh, because uh, we don't have mother, and uh, he does a uh, quite dangerous job. What about us? If something ha happens, we'll stay alone. And I, I, I don't like the idea, after all.
A lot of people used to say that war is not Finnish. This is, uh, now we have some special kind of war, without shelling, of course, but uh, with uh, everyday fight for surviving. This is very hard. If you, 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 you start to be um, less and less optimist, and it's, it's really hard. This is a special kind of war. In Sarajevo, a century of conflict has left deep scars. And even in peace, the aftermath of war is still deeply felt and personal. Before the war, he didn't do the stuff like that. We had normal life and we didn't live in fear. Uh, we, actually, we, we live in the same fear right now as we lived during the war because of him. You know, uh, maybe when you think you, you could lose someone, someone that you need a lot. Around the world, tended graves and monuments honor fallen warriors and cradle their memories. In the cause of peace, they invoke the tragedy of war. Yet we ignore their silent pleas. As the 21st century begins, five times as many conflicts rage across the planet as there were 100 years ago. Anthrax, sarin gas, depleted uranium shells are just some of the new remnants of war. These are dangerous times. For we have created wars that never end. <laughs> 